today I have with me author Brad Parks, and Brad's new book is Say Nothing, and I love this book. I feel I felt really bad for James Patterson when I got done with this book because he's not my new favorite thriller author anymore. Oh, uh, very <laughs> nice, I know Michelle. You have now gonna, curried favor officially. That's right. I I know it's going to really hurt his, you know ego some but I'm Brad <laughs> I wish I could explain to you the emotions that I went through in this book and I did not read your other books I'll be honest about that <laughs> I did not I get the new books off Goodreads they'll say new books and then I ordered the new books and I just and I like to do it that way you know and then I'll go back and read but for this show purposes I kind of like to know nothing I don't read reviews I, nothing. Right, right. I just go into it and then, and then I went into this, and I have to say for anybody who's looking for a light thriller, this is not their book. Not so much, no. <laughs> <laughs> I am a mom of six children, and okay. so it being about children, and, you know, as a mom, I'm like, oh, like I could just feel right. like, and, and at the ends of the chapters, like I'd find myself crying. Like the the last sentence, and I find I'm like, oh my god, this is a thriller, and I'm crying. Like you had me so hooked. Yeah. Well, you know? so if it makes you feel better, I cried when I wrote it too. Did you? I mean, and not only did I cry when I wrote it, I cried every single time I edited it. And I must have gone through this thing at least a dozen times. Like I already know how it's going to end, right? And I'm still like, you know, like the tears are coming out. Wow. I must have looked like an idiot when I was writing it. But yeah, I mean, I, I obviously had a real emotional connection to the characters. And so I'm pleased that you did too. Yes, I, I had a definite emotional. And, and so much um, for him. Um, okay, so, you know, just to back it up a little bit, this is a book about Judge Scott Sampson, and you're writing it from his perspective, and I became so attached to him that I was, you had me hating his wife, and then <laughs> loving his wife, and then hating his wife, you know, I was on this, you know, like, so as a woman, I'm like, hating this woman, thinking that she's some terrible person, and then loving her, and then hating her, and, you know, it was just, it was crazy, it, you know. And we can't talk about the ending, but but we can we can talk about the beginning and, and make sense of why if, if readers are thinking right now like this Michelle woman is nuts. You know the reason you're on this emotional roller coaster is it's a judge, but his children have been kidnapped. Yes. And I think anybody who's been a parent or loved children or any or been a human being for that matter, you know, like yeah, if children have been kidnapped, I actually I got a, a great note from a, a reader friend of mine not long ago. She's like, I don't know if there's enough booze and drugs in the world to get me through life if my children were kidnapped. Mm. So, I mean, that's the kind of stuff that the characters are going through. And, and, and that's why you probably started hating the wife, because wouldn't you start hating everyone if your children had been kidnapped? I, yeah, and you just had me so in his head. Okay? Right. So every emotion he's going through and right. the fact that he's showing up for work every day. And he's, and I, you know, in my prior life, um, before I was a stay at home mom of six, I worked, uh, I was a legal secretary for a lot oh, okay. of years. And so the, I always get hooked into the, the law stuff, right, you know, right. the fact that he was a judge and, you know, not that I knew a lot about ju what judges went through, but right. you know, enough, you didn't have to, it didn't matter. You know? Well, and, yeah, and neither did I when I first started writing the book actually, um, which is why I actually shadowed a federal judge for a while. Uh, to kind of learn about, because I had been, back when I had been a newspaper reporter, I had covered some cops and courts, mm -hmm. uh, but more like local district stuff. I had never really covered federal court. And of course, every courtroom, you know, the rules of procedure are slightly different. The, you know, the case law is slightly different. Um, so, and, and, you know, more than anything with the judge, it's like, what, what's going on in that back room anyway? And what's, you know, what, you know, you see the robe, but you don't see what's underneath the robe. Like there's a heart beating underneath that robe and getting a real sense of that. So that's what, you know, I, I shattered a judge. I can't say too much about it because I, I promised the judge anonymity. Um, so, you know, in exchange for kind of opening me to that world. Uh, but it was, it was really fascinating to know how much, um, emotional connection there was for the judge that I shadowed to these cases. Like I would be, watching something that to me was like this routine drug sentencing, right? Could you get more of a common thing? And yet when you're the person who is actually responsible for sending that other human being to jail 
for 10 years or 12 years. And by the way, so that's, you know, even within narrow sentencing guidelines that we have now, there's some amount of give and take where the judge really has to decide, does this guy go away for 10 years or does he go away for 15 years? And by the way, that's five pretty miserable years of your life and five years when that's the person who's going to be separated from his family and out of his community. And like that weighs incredibly heavily on the judge that I shadowed in ways I never understood before. So there was all kinds of things I, I learned from that that experience. Yeah. And as a, even as a husband and a dad, you know, like I said, as a woman reading it, I'm like, he's just amazing. I mean, he's perfect. There's, a, you know, it seems like <laughs> there's everything perfect about this guy, you know, like he's just this going about being, you know, being a dad, being a husband, being a judge, and then his world just gets rocked. And, you know, and, yeah. and, the, and the thing that I loved about the way you foreshadowed some of the stuff too, you know, about his wife, you know, like I would get to a certain point and be like, I remember when he said something about like, right. you know, like there was so many things that you snuck in there that. Well, yeah, you have to like throw in the little things, little thing, little thing, little thing. And then the big thing, yes. you know, yes. um, yeah. And in terms of his life, I mean, I, I, I really kind of, um, Modeled it after yourself, who is also equally as perfect of a well, husband and father. I don't know, though. Like, I really, I do have this great life, right? Uh -huh. I mean, I have a wife that I love, and I have two healthy kids, and I have a job that I love. And so, yeah, obviously the details of our lives are very different. I'm not a federal judge. Right, Nobody right. Nobody would give me that kind of authority or importance. But, like... There was a lot about Scott that I could really identify with because it's like, yeah, take that perfect world, that world you love, and then turn it completely upside down. And then take all those things that matter so much to him and systematically take it away from him and take it away from him and take it away from him. I think one of the things I learned about crime uh, back when I was a newspaper reporter was – when I was interviewing people who had just been victims of crime or they just lost a family member to crime, like I was really seeing them at the worst time of their life. Mm -hmm. And that when you are seeing someone on the worst day of their life, that is a really amazing point for fiction as well. I mean, obviously I was approaching it from a non-fictional standpoint as a journalist and I kind of always being aware like, wow, this is, this is the worst day of this guy's life. But how do people respond to that and how do they react to that? And what does it do to them and how does it test them? Like I was always fascinated by that. And so I always kind of want to explore those things in fiction. When you take a, I, and, I, and I'm not, and forgive me, Michelle, I'm kind of prattling on here a bit, but, okay. you know, I, I think this gets categorized as being domestic suspense, right? Yes. And to me, what domestic suspense is, that these are ordinary people, you know, like these are not, look, I love to read Jack Reacher as much as the next guy, mm -hmm. right? But yes. Scott Sampson is not someone who can break your jaw right. just by looking at it, right? right? right. And he's not an ex-Secret Service whatever who is a, a polymath. And uh, and can can break locks with uh, with toothpicks <laughs> and like like he doesn't have these skills right he's just this ordinary person and when you take an ordinary person and subject them to something extraordinary how do they respond and that's what I really like to explore in my novels yeah and like it wasn't just about like that day it was like right. day after day right. You're, like waking up with him going to bed with him like how does he sleep how does he you wake went up to bed with him you slut <laughs> sorry. I'm terribly inappropriate. And speaking, speaking of that, like, you get Lee Child to, like, mm. hmm. I was like, yeah, wow. I'm... I mean, like I said, you're you're my new favorite, so. Well, thank I... you. So, and actually, if we're, if, if we're bragging about stuff, yeah, um, I really also, um, I don't know if you, you'll be able to see, um, Sue, Sue Grafton. Graf did. I did not notice that. Yes, yeah. it is. Yes. Um, and I, I, I don't get me wrong. I love Lee. I think he's terrific. But like to get a blurb from Sue Grafton too, who I, I got the chance to meet um, in 2014. Uh, she was the guest of honor at Left Coast Crime, uh -huh. where I was the Toastmaster, and so we got to hang out a little bit. And she is just like this great, wonderful woman, uh, you know, who I admire so much. I mean, not only just for what she's done for the, for the genre, I mean, in terms of being a real trailbreaker, but like, she's still writing great books, she you know? Is, and I was and she's, thinking, you know, I remember, isn't she the one, uh, you know, I'm like jogging my memory because I do read a lot of books. Just Isn't yeah. she the one that started the, with the alphabet, right? Alphabet, yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, so like she's a, now down to like, I, I think X just came out, you yeah. know, and to see that, that, you know, like the quality she had when she was doing C, D, and E, she's still bringing <laughs> that quality and that energy to W, X. And of course, right. nobody wants to talk about Z. Don't talk about but, Z. Yeah. But. 
Yeah, that's absolutely. And that's what I was thinking when I read this, because I've talked to a couple of other thriller writers, but what I always think about with this is like how difficult when you're sitting down and you've yes. got this story, but you've got to lead the reader in order to become my favorite. You have oh, to lead no. me <laughs> on this. On you, this should trail. I take notes now, Michelle? Sorry. <laughs> You have to, you have to keep me awake. You have to keep me saying like last night I was refreshing some of it and I get, then I started reading it and I'm going through it again and again. Like it's that right. kind of a book. Okay. Where you're going, I want to see where he, wait, I know he foreshadowed this one part, but you had to keep me going back and you got to keep me thinking, where did I read that? Or where did I miss that? Right. When something pops up and I'm like, when you're writing that, how, and I actually, I saw you in an interview on YouTube and somebody asked you this question and you said something like, well, I torture my wife and then I go for a run and then I come back yeah. and tell her how awesome I am. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's about, about the size of it. Yeah. How do I, how do I come overcome but writers? In your, but like, you know, you know, are you an outliner? I mean, do you no. outline it all out? No, no. I'm absolutely a, uh, you know, so you've probably learned, uh, there's the distinction between what we call the plotters and the pantsers. Pantsers, yes. I'm a total pantser all the really? way. I'm seat of the pants, baby. Um, and I actually, like, I learned kind of the hard way that I needed to be a pantser. Uh, I had a book that we won't talk about much uh, that I outlined meticulously. Like, I, I, I created an 18,000-word outline because I had, you know, three storylines coming together. <laughs> it was very intricate, and all the trains had to come into the station at the same time. And I, I wrote this book, and at the end of it, I actually ended up throwing it away. Because there was no life in the scenes for me. Because every day I was sitting down knowing, okay, let me look at my outline. Oh, okay, that's the scene I have to write today. Here we go. Do, 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 do. Oops, I hope I didn't just uh, make you go away, Michelle. No. Um, you know, as I'm, as I'm pantomiming typing. Yeah, the people can't see that I was pantomiming typing it. But, um, you know, like I knew what I had to write every day. And for me, that was boring. Yeah. Like, it took the fun out of it. Like, what I really enjoy about this is I never know what's going to happen when I sit down to the keyboard. Like, yeah, I've got some ideas because I've been out for a run the day before and been thinking about it and everything like that. But, man, when a scene goes in an unexpected direction or when a character does something that surprises you, I mean, that's the fun, man. And to be able to kind of follow that rabbit hole and see where it goes is what I love. And then, of course, the trick is oftentimes – say something two-thirds of the way through the novel, a character surprises me or does something I don't expect, well then, yeah, I'll go through the first two-thirds of the novel and make it look like I knew they were going to do that all along, okay. even though I didn't. Okay. Uh, and that's where the, yeah, that, that's where I get my thriller writer tricks in there. But, um, I, you know, I think it's important. I mean, as a reader, I feel like I've been cheated if there's something that happens late in a novel that hasn't been established in some way, that hasn't been, right. that doesn't feel like it's part of the character, that doesn't feel like right. it's uh, authentic and, and, and like, it, you know, it, that has arisen organically from who the character is. And, and so I, I kind of make sure that, that, you know, everything a character does, especially late in a novel, is true to who I think they are and true to who I've established they are to the reader. And, but what about, like, okay, so you, do you know who, just, who did it? Like, in your brain no. when you first, Really? Not a clue. Um, and there are, and this is, this is why I stumble across writer's block so much. Because it's like, oh God, what do I do now? Um, oh God, who did it? I don't know. Yeah, Let's think and, about and this. you know, and I've had some, you know, I, I kind of like. I mean, it really is. You're walking a tightrope without the net underneath you. There's no question about that. Um, and I've had some novels, um, not this one, where it's like, man, I'm getting to where I'm 80, 85 percent of the way done, and, and it's like you're you're in a 747. <laughs> And you're running out of fuel, and you're looking for the runway, and you're like, okay, where, where's the runway? Hello, runway. And it can get a little dicey in there. Like, okay, the Brad, end. come on. you got to come up with something really good here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, like, okay, here we go. And then, of course, when you do come up with something, oh, it's, 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 you know, that's when I start bragging to my wife about what a wonderful writer I am. Because, you know, up until that point, I'm like, oh, boy, I've really screwed myself this time. That's it. It's over. Like, I'm done. i got to quit now. You know, let me go sell insurance down the road. But, um. Uh, well, I can't wait. I can't wait to read your other books. I'm very excited to do that because having read this one, I'm like, oh my god, I can't wait to see what the other one because because the other one was a series. Right. This is, your right. First, is this the first standalone? Besides this is my it? first standalone. Yeah. Uh, which and and honestly, I mean, uh, is a writer supposed to admit this? I don't know. Like, this is my best book so far. 
Uh, like this is definitely a better book than what I've written in the past. There's no I mean, question don't you about. Don't think they're going to get better? <laughs> yeah. Know? Well, I mean, let's hope so, right? Like, <laughs> yeah. at least I mean, I'm not dead yet, so <laughs> you know, hopefully. And that's you know, that's one of the things I enjoy about this business. I mean, like, if you are, I, I used to be a sports writer once upon a time, mm-hmm. and it's like, you know, by the time you're 27 in most sports, you're about as good as you're ever going to get, right? right. Uh, or heck, in some sports, I mean, if you're a gymnast. You're washed up at age 19. I had a daughter who's an elite gymnast. Oh, yeah. So you know what I'm talking about. I I mean, you know, the the moment they go through puberty, it's all over. So eh, what are you going to do? Yeah, exactly. But, you know, so I I love this business that, like, I mean, I don't think most writers really hit their stride until they're in their 50s sometime at least. And for some writers, it's even later than that. So, I mean, I think it's a a very, very long, long learning curve. And it's sort of, it's fun to be on the uphill part of that. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. And I read that you started writing at 14. Yeah. And having raised a couple of 14 year olds, I was so <laughs> impressed with your ambition because, you know, I have a hard time motivating 18 year olds, let alone 14 year olds. <laughs> well, OK, so I, I have to tell the truth about that, then, Michelle. I, the, the real reason I got into writing uh, for the money and the sex, oh, basically. Okay. So, the, well, the money was the job I got when I was 14 was it was covering um, a, a basketball team for the local newspaper. And the job paid 50 cents a column inch, which at the age of 14 was more money than I could make babysitting. Right. Because the editor would never cut me. He'd let me go on for like 40, 50 inches. So like, <laughs> hey, that was like 25, 30 dollars, you know, whatever. I'm like, woohoo, I'm rolling in it. And then. The sex part was that the job covered like the Ridgeville High School girls basketball team. Oh. Oh, yeah. So I figured out in my devious 14-year-old horny mind (laughs) that like if I was the guy who was putting these girls' names in the newspaper, they'd have to talk to me, right? Right. And then I could get lots of dates. Right. It didn't work. Part, it didn't work out for you. It didn't work out. But it was it was good to learn the lesson early that not all of your writing goals would be met, right. you know, and that it was more about the striving than it was about the result, uh, which is a, a lesson that has, has served me well over the years. Well, I'm in Pennsylvania. I am born and raised in Pennsylvania. So I saw you were born in Jersey. And I was like, okay, yep. so you've got the, you know, you've kind of stayed on the East Coast, even though you, you went up to Connecticut. And then now you're in Virginia, right? Yeah, I always say I'm from Interstate 95. You're from Interstate 95. You just kept because I, I've spent my whole life within an hour of Interstate 95 in like seven different states. Isn't that but crazy? you know, 95 is the is is definitely the the common thread to it all. That's pretty funny. So as you get older, you might want to keep going down 95 to where warm weather exists. Right. It's- right. Exactly. <laughs> my, my, my skin gets a little thinner and stuff like that. Yeah. Hey, Florida's waiting for me, man, and, and I'd be within an hour of 95. There we yes. go. That's right. I mean, it is true now. I mean, you can do the whole eastern seacoast on 95, so it's, you know, it's not an, an, not an issue. But, okay, so what is next? I, you've won everything. You've won all these awards. <laughs> I mean, I don't, has, the, has this book won any awards yet? Well, it only came out like a couple of weeks ago, Michelle. So like, like, give, weeks, like let, let, let the baby breathe, something. Michelle. Let it breathe. Come on. Um, so, you know, I, I think that's the, the thing that drives all writers is what comes next is write a better book and then write one that's better than that. So um, the next one is actually I've, I've turned it in. It's now in copy I edits. See, that's so it's what ready I always to go. Like to know. Like, is it here or is it yep. actually No, no, no. It is, it is on the page. It is, it is ready to go. Yes. Um, it actually uh, deals with the child welfare system. Um, I've always mm-hmm. been a bit of a government wonk. Mm-hmm. And I've always been fascinated by the idea that we endow our state, our government, with the authority to take people's children from them. Like, what an awesome, awesome responsibility, right? right. And I think most of us know that that is only done at, you know, last, last possible uh, possibility and, and only in the most extreme cases and only when it's incredibly deserved. But, of course, the what-if question that always gets a thriller writer going is – what if someone abused that authority? And so this is a book that begins with a woman coming to pick up her kid from childcare, and she learns he has been taken by social services, and she doesn't know why. And that's how the book begins. You know, it's interesting because I lived on a um, on Andrews Air Force Base for a while, and okay. when I kids, when my older children were young, and. That was something that was a real threat to us. They really would use that, like oh, yeah, man. 
Yeah, like they're, they're really strict about the children thing. Like, but I remember my oldest son, and he's the one editing this. But he had gone out to play, and right. you know, you turn your back for a minute or something, and you look away. Well, the MPs had come and picked him and this other little kid up, and it was a real. You're like, I just turned. You know, he was four. You know, yeah. they, they're pretty oh, safe sure. on an Air Force base. They're getting yeah. anywhere. You know, I mean everybody's on there has a reason to be on there, but still like they use that. And oh, I yeah. remember being very scared of that situation. Well, like, I don't, you know, you always joke as parents, right? Oh, yeah. well, social services can t come take my kid, you know, but like the fact is they could yeah. if they wanted to. And especially it's, it's horrible to say, but a lot of times in poorer communities, and this comes into the book I wrote, people will use social services as a weapon. Right. Against people they don't like, they'll be like, "Oh yeah, you know that 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 woman in that trailer over there. I saw her hitting her kid, you know, just because you know the woman in the trailer parked in her parking spot or something." <laughs> like that. I mean, like, I mean, you know, we laugh, but like, yeah. really, really horrible things have been done, and you know, pity the social services worker has who to has to like out. suss out, like, okay, what's real abuse and what is a, a false story, right. and has this kid really been hurt, and like, is that you know, is that bruise there? Is that from mama hitting him? Or is that from him falling out of a tree? Yeah. You know, I mean, and it's it's a hard, hard job, man. I mean, it there's is. no doubt about that. It is. And that's another in that right there. Kids injuries. You know, I had a okay. son who burned his arm. And right away you go in there with a burn. I had to take him to the hospital. And it's like, how did he burn his arm? And you're like, yeah, so, yeah. I was like all yeah. confused. I was young. And I was like, what do you mean? He rolled on my curling iron. They were like, what? He rolled. How do you do that? I'm like, I yeah, yeah. Know. He rolled and, they, my and they have to ask. They're mandatory reporters, you know, yes. so they are they are absolutely required. They could get in a lot of trouble if they don't. Yeah, if they don't so that sounds up. like a great book. So okay, yeah. so you write like this is coming out. You've got one over there. So then, what do you? Ha what's your like process? Like as your, you know, like so you you always have one like gone and and out, and then you got another yeah. one that you're working on. And you know, so I'm always uh, like promoting one, right? Editing one, one. <laughs> and then thinking about and and working on another one. And it, so it's it, it gets a little confusing sometimes. It's like. Okay, so I'm supposed to be talking about this thing because this thing is what's in the bookstore right now. Right. But I wrote it like two years ago, you know. <laughs> like, um, so that's always a you know, but that that comes with the business. So, right. uh, so but yeah, it's a I, good yeah. problem to have. You got yeah. When you got that kind of books coming, you know, through you, I mean, that's a good problem. Well, and I think there's always like, I, you know, probably ideas are always in some form of of percolation where and and, it, and like for a few years even sometimes where it's like uh i mean the the, the child welfare book was something i'd had in my head for a while mm -hmm. you know and i didn't know how i was going to do it or what I, but it would like and then it suddenly it bubbles to the top and it feels like okay it's time to do that book but i think most of the books are themes or are in areas where i've probably had an interest for a while mm -hmm. uh and then i finally decide to sit down and write that book do you keep a schedule like every day? Do you write for a certain amount of time? Like, do you oh yeah, yeah. Out? I am. I am yeah. absolutely. Uh, I'm a morning writer, um, and I am a, a member. Uh, some would say even a pastor of uh, something called the Church of a Thousand Words. Okay. Uh, and, and if you want to Google Brad Park's Church of a Thousand Words, uh, you can actually find a full sermon that I've written on this topic. But uh, but a thousand words a day is like my religion. I write a minimum of a thousand words a day, no questions, no excuses. That's what I do. Um, and I, I typically, well, so Michelle, do you have um, Hardy's restaurants in Pennsylvania? Hardy's, yes, I saw that. You like to go okay. to Hardy's. Well, yeah, so I, I work at a Hardy's restaurant. Food. Hardy's is definitely part of but my process is, yeah. because it, it fuels me with um, Coke Zero, which is my delivery mechanism of choice. <laughs> uh, it takes me out of the house. So I yes. can't be concerned about the, the dishes that I haven't done or the leaky faucet that I need to fix or whatever else. Right. And then finally, this is key, no wireless internet. Because for me, internet is like the biggest distraction that has ever been created in the history of humankind. Because like I am like, I mean, I'm a writer. Like I'm distracted by everything. I'm like, oh, squirrel, you know, like whatever. <laughs> or, um, you know, in the case of the internet, I'm like, ooh, shark video, ooh, <laughs> more shark videos, you know, and then, you know, like 45 minutes are gone on and you're like, wait, what was I writing? Was, was I writing what today? I don't know. So Facebook I'm so today. serious about avoiding the internet when I write. I'm going to show the viewers at home. It's a little bit of a, um, this is a special show and tell. <laughs> this is my phone. 
viewers at home. Uh huh. Yeah, that's a flip phone. Yeah, Ooh. Ooh, the uh, the Smithsonian is after it, but oh. there's no internet on this baby. So, like, when I'm writing, man, all I'm doing is writing, and all I'm thinking about is my story, and I am plugged in, and I am honed in, and that's what I'm doing. So that's like a thousand words a day, no weekends or weekends? So my wife does take me, make me take one day off a week, a uh, but sometimes I don't do it. So when I, especially as, a, well, so it's a balance, right? I find if I don't take one day off a week, I start to get cranky. Um, but when I get toward the end of a novel, I get kind of feverish about it because I just want to get to the end, right. partly because I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, and right. I really want to know what's going to happen, right? <laughs> so uh, I will start writing more and kind of faster, and uh, and I might start doing like 10, 20 days in a row without a, without a break. Mm. Um, but, uh, but yeah, generally six days a week. Um, and and a thousand is... I mean, that's thousand is my like, minimum. It generally works out to you know like 1,300, 1,400, um, which is generally about yeah four, four and a half hours, something like that. Like I can always tell when I'm done because I'll, I'll be working on this one paragraph and working on it and working on it and it's not working and it's not working. And I'm like, what is my problem? And then I'll look up at the time and it'll be like, oh, I've been sitting here for four and a half hours. I'm done. And then the next morning I sit down and that paragraph comes like that, you yeah. know, so it was time. Yeah. And that's what, I mean, the discipline of writing, that's what I, I was talking to this author last week, she's a mom of four children under four, because she has a son. Ooh, ooh. I am Oof. not kidding, I'm not kidding. And she gets up at 4.30 in yeah. the morning and writes, and her husband does the breakfast thing with the kids yeah. and gets them off, awesome. you know, to wherever. But I mean, the discipline that that, I was just like, wow, yeah. you are well, awesome. So, you know what, and that's a writer who's going to make it. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, if this is a writing show, we as writers don't talk enough about toughness yes. and how tough you have to be and how resilient you have to be to do this business. Yes. And part of that toughness is like, I mean, there's nothing more frustrating to me, I guess is the word, or just I, like when, when you hear someone say, oh, I've always thought about writing a novel. Like, really? You're thinking <laughs> about it, huh? How's that working for you, buddy? Like, do you think, like, again, I used to be a sports writer. Does LeBron James sit around and go, yeah, you know, I've always thought about playing basketball. Like, no, he gets off his butt and he does it. And like, and, and, and like the excuses people will come up with for why they're not writing are always a little funny to me because it's like, oh, well, I've got this going on or that going on. I always, um, I always talk about Mary Higgins Clark, right? Mm -hmm. The queen of mysteries, 85 million books in print, all this right. other stuff. Right. What she went through before her first manuscript, and I think her first several books, she her, her husband died at a very young age, so she was raising four kids by herself. She had a full-time job, and she would get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and write books on her kitchen table until about 6 o'clock when the kids started waking up and she had to get them off to school. She had to get herself off to work. She worked a full day. She came home. She collapsed. She did it all over again. And I always say, if Mary Higgins Clark can do that, you can handle your Whatever. Whatever it is you have going on in your life, right. you know, and we all have distractions. Like I call it the um, the myth of the perfect writing day, like that somehow there's this writer out there who has this ideal scenario where, you know, <laughs> they always have this full uninterrupted night's sleep uh, and then they wake up with absolutely no distractions whatsoever because apparently they don't have real families and they don't have real lives right. um, and then their their manservant who takes care of all their piddling needs um, is there to to make tea for them and to open their laptop at, at just the right uh, angle and then to serve them freshly baked scones just as soon as they get like no that day does not exist like all writers are dealing with crap all the time now i mean i'm lucky i'm i'm and i and i make no bones about this i do this full time right, right. and that's an incredible luxury i didn't really do it for my my first two books i had a full-time job while i did it uh and now I, I you know have arranged my life in a way that i have this luxury and and thank god my wife has health insurance that's um that, that, that one works. of the great secrets i, I can remember <laughs> talking to um julia um spencer fleming Sorry, Julia Spencer Fleming, if I can – three names, it's hard. Yes. Um, and when she first made the New York Times bestseller list, I was like, Julia, that's just amazing. Congratulations. What's the secret? And she goes, oh, that's easy. A spouse with health care. There you go. Yeah. So um, – but, uh, you know, like – the, you, you really do have to stay with this for, for a long, long time and, and really have the, the toughness to persevere through 
everything life is going to throw at you. Um, and this is something that's particularly, and forgive me that I'm rambling on, but this is a passion. This is a topic I'm very passionate about. Like particularly for women, I find, um, and particularly for moms, telling them, okay, mom, who are trying to write, you have to be selfish. Yes. Selfish is very hard for mom. You have to say, you know what? This is my writing time during the day. This is the time I've carved out for me. Your, you know, the fact that you can't find the other sock can wait. The fact that you need a snack, you know, get your own snack. The fact, you know, whatever, or, you know, get your spouse or your mother or whoever it is who's watching the kids to deal with that and like, and, and give yourself that time, you know, because that's like the greatest gift you can give yourself. And then be be really selfish about guarding that time and saying, no, you know what? The other 20 hours of this day are going to be you. And that's fine. And it's going to be someone else. And that's fine. But these four hours or these three hours or these two hours or whatever you can carve out, right. these are my time. Right. So go away, you know? Right. And, and you know, what always, what made me want to do this is because I, when I was raising my children, I was watching Oprah and every month she started right. this book of the month. Okay. Right. And she would change authors. She would take them from unknown. And I knew this right. woman who worked at a bookstore and she would tell me what happened to that author oh. as soon as it became book of the month. That's what, that's okay. what we all dream of. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but you know, for a reader, it's like a month, like she announced the next book and I'm like, what am I going to read till we do the next, like that's a day right. for me. That's not a book of the month. That was crazy, you know, but I used to think how awesome that the authors got to come on to Oprah, talk about their books. It changed their day. It changed their life overnight. Changed their life. Yeah. It changed their life. And you know, they were these ordinary writers and she took the, she took ordinary writers for the most part and made them into very famous authors. And I was like, authors like to talk. I want to do that, but on a bigger scale, because I don't want to do it once a month. I want to do it every day. And now I'm doing five and six a day. Sometimes right. today I have three. So, you know, it's a slower day, but I do it. And I, and I want that. Like, that's what I want. I'm like, authors want to talk about their books. I want to put their books out there. I'm not Oprah, but you never know, maybe someday, but you know, it's like, get them out there, get the books out there, get the author out there. And it's a, now we have that chance, you know, we got YouTube yeah, yeah. and we got Facebook and I got LinkedIn and you know, so right, I love, right. that's what I love to do is talk to you guys and, and just like dissect your books and tell you how much I love your books. And, well, you know. yeah, yes. And, and, and some of us, so I'm obviously, you can probably tell a bit of an extrovert. Uh, and so for me, I'm like, Ooh, I actually have somebody to talk to. Yay. Because yeah. you know, the hardest part of this job sometimes is that like, what? I have to be alone for four to four and a half hours and not talk to anyone. <laughs> this is hard. So Thanks. Thanks for talking to me, Michelle. Yeah, and you know what? A lot of authors say no to me because of that. They're like, oh, I'm not good at media. I'm not good. I'm yeah. a writer. I'm not good at... There are yeah. authors that are like that. Like, they are very closed off. But I am so happy when I find people that want to talk to me about their books. And you did. And I was so happy. And this book, everybody, is amazing. Amazing. We cannot wait until your next book. So you just keep writing. And keep going to Hardee's. And I will. <laughs> My children will starve otherwise, so it makes it really easy. That's right. That's right. I'm so happy to meet you, Brad. I really am. It was so much fun. Michelle, it was a real pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Thanks for talking. I will put all your links at the bottom. Everybody can find you, your website, your Facebook, and your Amazon on where to order this book. And Are you doing a tour, by the way? Uh, I have been touring. Okay. Um, so if you go to my website, www.bradparksbooks.com, yes. and click on the events button, you'll see. Although my touring for this book is kind of winding down. Um, but you know, there's always more to come. Um, I also have a, um, a newsletter. Uh, my newsletter is, um, I, I have to warn people it's written by my interns. Um, and my interns are very cheeky and very irreverent and they're, they're always making fun of me and pulling awful pranks and things like that. So you can also sign up for my newsletter and my interns will always tell you what I'm up to admittedly from their peculiar slant. <laughs> Because I did see you're going to be at, in New York City, I wrote it down somewhere, it's like called Thrill Fest. Yeah. Thriller, Thriller Fest, Fest. yes. What, can you just explain that to us for a minute? Yeah, minute? sure. Uh, Thriller Fest is the annual convention of the International Thriller Writers. Uh, so you have thriller writers coming from all over the world to New York City um, to, sorry, I shouldn't say drink at the bar because then you'll think we're all luscious. <laughs> 
So we're not coming to drink at the bar with each other. We're coming to, oh, sorry, do panels and uh, improve the genre and network and support one another and drink at the bar (laughs) and network. And so does that involve any like you know fans like me? Can we come to this or is this? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, because it is, I'd it is love absolutely to come open get to fans. Books from all you got, you know, like meet you yeah. and I'll get so people can do yes. that. Okay, because it's yeah, like a yeah, look, every every author there will do a panel. They then sign books, uh, and they're I think more than anything. We're all kind of wandering around the Hyatt in New York City, and so like you see an author you like, you pull them aside, and they're thrilled to talk to you for the most part. Well, I hope I can meet you. I'm going to try. I'll be there. I'm going to try. I know it's July, and I'm like, what am I doing in July? But New York City is only a very short bus ride for me away. Yeah, I was going to say, hop on a train or something like that. Yes. It's, it's accessible. Yes, it's very it's very accessible for me. So anyway, thank you, Brad, and happy writing, and I can't wait to hear your next book. Okay. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you, too. Have a great day.